To the blood of song, to the belief of drainage, the blood of song can be obsolete. The blood of song is current to the songs I leave. The nature of song is within the portrait that I lay flat in the land imprinted in the sand. What was your opinion regarding Fidel Castro and the Bay of Pigs incident in the early 1960s? At that age, probably a very naive opinion. Uh, being all of 18 years old, uh, 19 years old, when the crisis came about, it was really more one of just trying to believe that, uh, that our country was doing the right thing. And in respects to uh, what Castro had done, which was uh, pretty much wipe out half of the country, at least what we were heard, uh, the attitude was that uh, he was uh, a threat to uh, our country and a threat to uh, to uh, the democracy, democratic countries in, in general. What was your opinion about the Cold War in the early 60s? How did you feel about Russia, communism, nuclear weapons, arms race? How did you feel about all those? That's, that's a really very difficult question to answer because when you deal with the age and where we're at and my upbringing, uh, my dad was a combat medic back in World War II. I had four, four other uncles that are also in the military, World War II veterans. And so from that perspective of communism, uh, I'd say we had a very naive perspective. Uh, anybody that was not viewed as uh, pro-American, uh, you were viewed as communist in general. So I would say, again, a very naive point of view, not really knowing the political implications of what other people's country, I mean, what other people in other countries are trying to do. And, and again, uh, I think that uh, a big flaw in our foreign diplomacy is, is the American arrogance. We just tend to assume that we are better than everybody else, and we tend to believe that we're always right no matter what, which is really incorrect. Uh, very, very frightened. Uh, it was one of those things that we knew as far as the training that we got and the, uh, the potentiality of, of a third world war was always in our mind. I mean, that was our training because the guys that we had and the units that we were with, once we were on a mission, it meant nuclear war, which was really a case of really the unknown. Uh, but we know it was going to be massive destruction. And, and all our training really, really focused on that. Because once we were in, once everything went, went forward, then we knew that uh, thousands and thousands of people were going to get killed. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the West. How did you feel in October 62 when President Kennedy addressed the nation informing that there are nuclear weapons now in Cuba? Like, how did that make you feel to hear that? At that age, uh, again, a very naive perspective, meaning that uh, I knew that uh, our unit was ready to go. Uh, whether we thought it was right or wrong was not for us to question. It was just a discipline thing. And uh, 
and I'd say that again that uh, I felt that most of the guys in my unit uh, uh, was just a question that well if it happens it happens now could we justify it probably not but again you start training and the discipline factor you, you do what you're told and uh, you do what you're trained to do the Soviet government would never become involved when we got the word it was really a, a question of, of not really having a, a lot of detailed information. We all knew something was going on in general. But in the, see my, my unit is called, uh, at that time was called the Strategic Air Command, which is really the big bombers, the guys that carried uh, the uh, nuclear warheads. And so our branch is really the, the one that would be at the forefront of any kind of uh, war conditions. Uh, uh, the one word that we always hated to hear or didn't want to hear was what they called Zulu power. And Zulu hour meant that you already headed out with a mission to drop some H-bombs on some country. And we did hear Zulu hour when I was in, when we had the Berlin crisis. Our, our, our B-52s that were assigned to March Air Force Base were flying towards Russia. And so we already knew that. I was assigned to what is called an air mobility team. And uh, the night before uh, President Kenny gave his speech, my, uh, my squadron commander, I shall remember his name, Major Mendenhall, came to the barracks and alerted me and he said, Ramirez, if anything's going to happen tonight, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen tonight. And that was about, uh, about 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, and being part of that air mobility team, I knew my responsibilities. I had my gear already packed and ready to go. But uh, fortunately, the Zulu hour condition was, was scaled down. And the next morning, about 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, we got the word that the condition had been, uh, had been reduced. But it was a very frightening experience. Uh, I still remember when, uh, as far as the, the climate of the, of the base itself, normally, uh, you know, we're all, all the guys are always buzzing, talking about this or that, and it was quieter than a church. It was just like a, almost like zombie-like type of attitude. Nobody was talking because of the fear. And uh, that lasted for quite a while. Uh, we knew the condition was still out there, and we knew that, uh, that as far as the ability to strike, we, we could do that. And uh, the most frightening part is that our, our B-52s were already up in the sky. We knew that where were they headed. And it was just a matter of getting the, the green light from, from the president to go ahead and hit Russia. Because we were not going to hit Cuba. We were going to hit Russia. At a time when both, both, both sides possessed weapons of mutual destruction. Well, again, you know, b being at the lower ranks, at that time, I, I believe I was all of a, an E-2 which is uh, uh, next to the lowest of the ranks. So we don't get that much information, detailed information. Again, you, you just get the orders and you do what you have to do and what you're trained to do. So, so in terms of, of any kind of a personal reaction, I don't think that I can say I had a personal reaction other, th other than, okay, if we have to do it, we have to do it. But again, it's more of training and the discipline factor. You don't question what you're told to do. You just do it. So from that perspective, it's, it's difficult to really say, yeah, I can analyze things or I can try to apply some kind of common sense or common logic. You, you, you just don't do that. You're not allowed to think that way. Um, so you, were you already prepared for war? Mentally, yes. Yeah, mentally we were. All of us were. And then um, what was the feeling as maybe possibly DEF CON 1 was coming? Like, did you feel that the war was necessary? You know, again, that's a difficult question to answer because when you look at it from the perspective of the individual, you would want to say, okay, uh, uh, maybe this is not the way to do it, uh, especially when you're young and you're trying to figure out you've got your life in front of you, and then you realize that, geez, if our boys do go to Russia, we're talking about World War III, which means nuclear war. Uh, but again, you don't have that time to think about that. You just do what you're told and, and you move forward. What was your biggest concern at the time? Quite honestly, my family, uh, because what I remember again, uh, our boys, our base had been isolated. I mean, we were we had a Zulu hour, which means we couldn't leave the base or anything. And uh, the times that we saw the TV, uh, we could see people panicking, and they were uh, ripping the stores apart. People panicked. Uh, the shelves were emptied out. Uh, people were just uh, had, hit, had hit a major level of panic, and there was major pandemonium, major fear going around. And so I thought about my family. Elated, uh, big relief. Uh, 
I think at, at that time, again, it was more a sense of trying to figure out what could have happened and not really understanding the, the, the true magnitude of what a Third World War would have meant other than mass destruction. So it was just a, a big collective relief from all of us. And uh, uh, I still remember uh, uh, the whole sense of the, of the military life changed dramatically at our base. This was at March Air Force Base. And a lot of us were just going around slapping each other and saying, glad it's over with. My name is Richard Michael Ramirez, and when I left the Air Force, uh, I was an E-4, or what they call an Airman First Class. Okay, um, what were your duties in the Air Force? My specialty was what they call an MOS, was the Supply Specialist, and uh, basically that was my assignment, and what I did was really provide uh, a, a lot of equipment for the uh, B-52 uh, bombers and the KC-135 uh, aircraft refuelers. And where were you stationed, and how long was your term? I was stationed at uh, March Air Force Base for two years, and then I was stationed overseas at uh, what they call Torrejon Air Base in uh, Spain, and there I was there for th a little bit over three years. What were the years you were stationed from? From March, I was uh, late December '61 till uh, December of '62, and then uh, overseas I was for there from uh, uh, January, middle of December of '63 till. Uh, middle of December of uh, 66. That's again difficult to say because uh, as a young man and at that time uh, my political view was very limited, very narrow. Uh, what I do feel though is that, that he held his ground and he really did what I think was per very, a very powerful, powerful uh, decision and that is to hold his ground. Uh, whether it was the right decision or not, uh, who knows. But I can tell you that uh, as far as from the military perspective at that time of my life, I felt that he made the right decision. Uh, subsequently, of course, when I got out and got an education and read what I read about the whole incident, then my, my perspective was much broader. But at that time of my life, it was just more a case that he's our military, military commander, and again, you do what you're ordered to do. What, or, and if you have any opinions on the Russian Premier Khrushchev and his actions during the crisis, what did you feel about what he was doing? Well, again, it's, it's a matter of, of trying to understand the period of time, and, and his behavior was completely, in, in my mind, and the mind of most of the guys in my unit, was that he was wacko. Uh, the idea of slamming his shoe on a pedestal when he's making those comments and going rather, uh, uh, I forget the term. Uh, I think it was used to, we used to call it, uh, oh gosh, something 11. But it's a military, military term that we used to use when, when a fellow went uh, uh, lost it and went psycho on us. And that's really what we thought about Khrushchev, that he had gone psycho, uh, lost perspective of what uh, he was trying to get himself into. And again, not understanding the political uh, implications. Our, our, my general perspective, and I think the guys in my unit had the same general perspective, that this guy was mentally sick and he needed uh, to be replaced. Not really. I think, again, you have to remember that at my age and being an 18, 19 year old young man, it's more a question of really trying to understand what's going on. Uh, we knew that we had the ability to respond, but the potentiality of what one would, what, what, what would happen if we did respond was still a frightening thought. Uh, that fear factor really hung on for the, for the longest time. And more so later on when we had what we call a broken arrow overseas, which was the first time we ever had such an incident in a foreign country where we had our, one of our B-52s and a KC-135 had collided, collided in the air. And we lost uh, our, uh, our both aircraft, all the men that uh, were on the aircraft, both aircraft got killed. And uh, just as important, we lost four H-bombs. And so our task, being part of that area, was to go pick up the, uh, the aircraft parts, uh, the, uh, the wreckage, basically, uh, pick up our, the survivors, not the survivors, but the, the bodies of our, of our fellow airmen. And then more important was to, uh, also to uh, locate the H-bombs. And that in itself is, a, is another story, because that was a frightening experience. Again, I have to... Uh, uh, constantly bring up this point about my age and, and, and the mindset at that time, 18, 19 year, old, 19 year old young man, and the idea of 
total mass destruction was very frightening. It wasn't just myself, but also uh, with the guys in my same unit. Uh, and we used to hang around in the bear garden and talk about this and, and really trying to figure out what could have happened and what might happen. And so from that perspective, I think collectively we understood what we had to do, but not necessarily agreed to what we had to do because the implications of mass destruction, not just for, for the enemy, but also for ourselves because we knew that the Russians had the capability of retaliation. And so you, you talk about that stuff and it is definitely very frightening. Uh, the whole idea of wiping out a nation uh, and what's going to happen afterwards. And I think again from a very, very, very narrow perspective, we, we knew what we had to do, we knew we could do it, but the question was, is, was really was it worth it? Is it worth it uh, of acting out in a bold move of initiating nuclear war and then not being accountable or responsible rather for the consequences? And we knew what had happened in Japan in World War, uh, World War II. The consequences are still being felt. Fond memories, I had many of them. I had also many sad memories. But if I were to say a fond memory, uh, I'd say perhaps uh, one of my fondest memories just being with my, uh, my buddies, my partners, uh, celebrating life for what it is. Uh, being to a certain degree irresponsible, not having a family, but only doing one thing and that is serving your country. But uh, I think my fondest memories was just being uh, with my buddies, the camaraderie, the sense of uh, being, uh, uh, what's the word for it, uh, being uh, unafraid, uh, being uh, not concerned with uh, life in general, but just waking up the next morning, going to duty and doing your job. and. Uh, and not really having any fear of anything. The art of song is to which I sing When thoughts are hell The art of song to all who know May forever be until we'll let's go And it's okay that we have you on camera? Yeah, okay. okay. And can you recall the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 19th? Yeah, it's a little before my time. I know what it, know what it is, basically, but I don't know a lot about it. Um, how old were you at that time? Just before I was born. I'll say your name, and is that it's okay for us to have you on camera? Yeah, my name is Vernie yeah. Williams, and the answer will be Um, I was in the Army then, stationed in uh, Chicago, Illinois, at 5th Army headquarters. And basically, uh, we were told to um, standby TV sets for the announcement and the, the, before it started since it was a, a headquarters they started alerting certain people days ahead of time that had top secret clearances and some of them were flown out that, that very that night before in fact so we didn't know what was going on no, I wasn't really scared. It was just the idea of not knowing what was going to happen next. I mean, I've been in service for about four years, and so I, mean, I was E5, you know, a sergeant. We're doing a we're doing a short film documentary about the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 1962. Um, you mind if we ask you some questions about that? I don't understand. Um, do you, can you recall anything about the yeah. Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962? Yeah. I can't hear you, dear. The, I'm having trouble with my hearing. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah. It's a Cuban Missile Crisis. Tell us where you were, what you were doing when you found out that Fidel Castro had bombs. Uh, it's the hell out of where I was at. I was home, probably. <laughs> Part of my office, you know. I wasn't too worried. You were worried? Really. I wasn't too worried, although I was uh, building a bomb shelter for myself at the time, so I must have been worried a little bit. You're building a bomb shelter yeah. because you're scared of the nuclear war? Yeah, the initial hit, you know. We never did finish it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you get the fallout shelters. And okay. They had the siren going every time, every month for testing, and we'd like, oh, well, that's the time they could attack. Nobody pay attention, you know? Yes. Yeah. How old were you at the time, and can you recall any memories of it? I remember how old I was. I do remember that it was after Kennedy's election, like a year later. You know, we had to do a lot more duck and cover drills at school. And everybody thought it was going to happen, and uh, it was a very tense time. 